Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Hassan Dai, co-editor of the Iranian American Forum, join us to discuss the Ayatollah's Americans. Mr. Dai will speak for 15 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Hassan Dai. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to present a brief review about Iranian-American community, their political activities, and level of engagement with the US political system. We lack sufficient data, and not much research has been conducted on the subject. So it is difficult to present a straightforward analysis. I will try my best with what we do know and within the time restraint that we have today. Iranian Americans constitute a vibrant and successful immigrant community. They come from very diverse cultural, religious, and political backgrounds. Many have come here through family immigration, some as students who have graduated here, and some as political refugees. There is a consensus that the vast majority of Iranian Americans, like the Iranians in Iran, oppose, dislike, or despise the regime. However, as I will try to explain, this majority is not fully engaged in political activism, and its huge potential has not been mobilized against the regime. There is also that part that support the regime. So please let me start with the pro-regime camp, and after that, we come to the other part. So, a minority of a minority of Iranian Americans support the regime. That includes the family members of Iranian officials, supporters of the so-called reformist faction, and those who are related or affiliated with the regime or financially profit from the current situation in Iran. There is also what we call pro-Tehran or pro-regime lobby. With National Iranian American Council, NAYAK, at its center, this lobby is well organized, works closely with its American allies, and this coalition altogether has some degree of influence in shaping, influencing US policy and public opinion toward Iran. But it has very limited support within the Iranian American community. In fact, its strengths comes mainly from partnering with American organizations and politicians. In order to, to understand the nature and power of this lobby, we should look at who these American organizations are and how it began. Proteron lobby started in the 1990s as a kind of joint project between some of US oil companies and Iranian regime to lift the sanctions, economic sanctions. They helped to create several Iranian American organizations to support this lobby. Most prominent among them was American Iranian Council, AIC, that was founded in 1997 and was relevant until about 2001 and 2002. Several oil company executives and former politicians sat on AIC's board but very few Iranians were actually involved with this lobby. With the funding from these business interests, US business interests, and support from Tehran, mainly from foreign ministry, a new generation of journalists and Iran experts flourished in think tanks and US media who promoted friendship with Tehran. As a result, a formidable political force in favor of appeasement was created in Washington that has continued to grow in power and influence during the past 24 years. Now we come to New York. In 2002, Tito Parsi, a young Iranian Swedish student who worked here as AIC's director founded his own lobby organization called NAYAK. And his goal was to recruit Iranian Americans 
for this anti-sanction lobby. NIAC's main, main target has been the second generation Iranian Americans who are educated here and generally sit on the left and oppose US foreign policy. It's, this is why it's been easy for some of them to buy into NIAC's narrative that the Iranian regime is a victim of US foreign policy hawks who seek a kind of regime change project in Iran. NIAC is also using the issues like travel ban, visa issues, the things like that, especially travel ban, to get some support from Iranian community. And issues that negatively affected thousands of Iranian American families. NIAC is also offering a wide range of internship opportunities to Iranian, young Iranian Americans in Congress that could help them for their future. And also, we should not dismiss the role of mainstream media here and TV channels who give a platform to NIAC. They act as one of NIAC's best publicity tools. But after almost 20 years and spending tens of millions of dollars, NIAC has been able to have a few hundred members. If you go to their website and you see tens of thousands of those supporters, during the lawsuits that I had with them, we understood that the supporters means mailing list, and some of them, they hate NIAC. So they have a few hundred members. So in order to, to compensate the lack of Iranian American support, NIAC has had good success with anti-war and left organization in the US. To understand this alliance between NIAC and these groups, we should go back a little bit to the, two, the year 2000. After the US invasion of Iraq and its disastrous consequences, an important anti-war movement was created in the United States led by American left-wing organizations. Then when in 2005 and six, the tensions between Iranian regime and United States escalated because of Iran's nuclear program, some of these groups claimed that the United States is seeking a pretext to wage a military attack against Iran. They gradually espoused the Iranian regime's propaganda campaign that Iran is a victim of US warmongers. Nayak and Iranian regime were successful in recruiting some of these activists and groups in fact, several hundreds of these activists traveled to Iran in what they called it peace or citizen diplomacy that was supported by Iranian regime. So these anti-war groups are very important to Nayak. And since 2006, two dozens of them and Nayak, they are working together, forming a coalition that tries to influence and shape US policy with Iran. Also, the second term of Obama's presidency. During that time, Nayak and his lobby partners were elevated from a pressure group to a White House partner. That helped Nayak to find new connections and influential allies that continue to support Nayak. Now, regarding the current influence, the current situation. I, feel, I will say that it has somehow diminished, several reasons for that. First, Iranian regime has been weakened in Iran. We have had two major popular uprisings in Iran since 2017, undermining one of the claims by Nayak that the regime is stable and the Iranian people do not want regime change. Secondly, Nayak and pro appeasement's main narrative has been discredited. That friendship with the Iranian regime would strengthen the so called moderates who would change Iran's foreign policy. In fact, Iranian regime's own behavior after nuclear deal debunked the myth of moderation. Javad Zarif's recently released tape also confirms that 
the so-called moderates are simply tools and facade for revolutionary God. They are powerless in Iran. Also, the growing anti-regime sent sentiments in Iran and the widening and unrepairable gap between the people and the regime has discredited, largely discredited, Nayak and pro appeasement the lobby. But I believe we should not underestimate the influence of this lobby. There are powerful circles in Washington who are seeking appeasement or engagement with the Iranian regime and looking for Iranian voice to justify their policy. These people find Nayak as their only and maybe best ally. So they support Nayak. So we should not underestimate them. Now let me go to the let me go to the regime with anti-regime camp here. As I mentioned, the majority of Iranian Americans are not engaged in political activity. There should be multiple reasons for that. In my opinion, one factor in the behavior of behavior of Iranian Americans is a culture that is implanted in them because of decades, not centuries of suppression. In Iran, especially under this regime, political activities against the regime have always had harsh consequences for the activists and their families. Iranian families typically advise their children to stay away from politics. Therefore, Iranian Americans are reluctant, reluctant to get involved, not only because it may be, maybe it is costly for, for them and their family back home, or at the very least impede their travel to Iran, but because of this cultural baggage of avoiding politics. Another reason is that we did not have, we have not had Iranians, I mean, in general, experiences democratic process, participation in political organizations and learning how to negotiate and compromise with each other. And the Iranian regime has been very, very active in inflaming and fueling these divisions between Iranian activists and groups. Also for a long time, Iranian Americans did not appreciate the need or the importance of getting involved with US political system to influence US policy with Iran. That has been changing rapidly, partly because they have a better understanding of New York's activities and its negative impacts on, on Iran. And here I should be, again, I should express my gratitude to Middle East Forum and Dr. Poit for supporting the, the lawsuit that they filed against me. I can't imagine if you had lost that lawsuit what a victory could be for New York. We wouldn't be here. Not only we, with the support from Middle East from, we handed them a defeat. We obtained a lot of documents, internal documents from New York that could help us and help many people to have a better understanding of how this pro-lobby, pro-Iran lobby is working. That's been very important. Another factor is that the two uprising in Iran and the prospect of the regime collapsing have encouraged Iranians to be more active in the United States. There is also social media that not only has given them a voice, but has connected the Iranians and encourages more activism. There are several Iranian American organizations in the United States are active in the Congress trying to influence US policy with Iran. I'm talking about organizations are active in regard to US policy with Iran. There are several of them. And the, the good thing is that more and more they're coming forward. There is MEK, People's Mujahideen Organization, that they have a lot of experience in this field. They have several affiliated organizations in different states that conduct district meeting with Congress members. They have long established ties with key members of the Congress from both parties. Recently, they, they introduced a bipartisan resolution that gathered a bipartisan majority in the Congress. 
There is also NUFTI, National Union for Democracy in Iran, led by Dr. Saeed Ganji, that has been active during the past several years and are much, <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Yes, I was talking about NUFTI, yes, Dr. Ganji, and they're getting more active. And before the pandemic, they had presence on Capitol Hill. There are also several smaller Iranian American organizations that are coming forward, and this is good news, uh, establishing contact with Congress members. There are several human rights organizations that are very active, uh, and th they have a lot of presence in the media and social media. There are civil society and women rights activists that are making their voices heard in Washington. So to conclude, I hope I, I have not forgotten anything. Uh, to conclude, um, I will say that for the regime camp or pro-regime camp, they are weaker, but they are still here. For the anti-regime camp, we are much in much better position now and we have a long way to go. I didn't mention Quincy Institute, and I would say that anyone interested, there is a recent report by Armin Rosen in the tablet magazines that is a wonderful report. You can see that is that health New York and pro Tehran lobby has seen something new for the two, three past years, and it's getting very, very active now. I hope I have not forgotten. I will check my notes. If something during the question, I will add that. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. And the article you just referenced is linked in your bio in our uh, webinar reminder email, if anyone's interested. Uh, so the first question we have in is, why are the Iranian regime's lobby groups like Nayak and Quincy, why have they never been investigated by the Justice Department? Yeah, that's my question too. I mean, so, you know, it is difficult, first of all, you know, we have some, someone like, for example, former ambassador Hossein Musavian was the Iranian ambassador to Germany, and he has a lot of suspicion on him about terrorism. He has been here since 2009, and no one goes after him. Many people, I don't understand. Honestly, I'm not a kind of witch hunt guy, you know, going after everyone. No, not at all. Anyone who is here legally, the, 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 the freedom of his speech, you want to support even the regime, you do it. But any connection to influence US policy with Iran, when it is coordinated with the Iranian regime, this is against the law and should be investigated. We have enough evidence that Nayak did it so, when Javad Zarif was here, in other occasions they did it. So I hope that you know they see the need that not only it is harmful to the Iranians, this pro-regime lobby, it is harmful to the United States national security. Thank you. Do you think policymakers in the United States understand the point you made about the myth of moderation and the facade they're presented in the world and the effect it has and has had in misleading policies toward Iran? You know, I first of all, I hope so. <laughs> I say it's been weakened. This, you know, this illusion has gone away in good part, but it still is here because there are two approaches. For example, during Obama, Obama's presidency, even President Obama himself told a couple of times that they hoped that friendship with Tehran would change the nature of the regime, nature of his foreign policy. This is a kind of illusion. I believe they have come to a point that they are looking for the minimum, just reduce the tensions and wait for the time. Because the United States uh, is not looking for regime change because they don't want to, the people here, they don't want to pay the price for it. it. It seems very costly for them. They are not sure about it. So they are waiting. I don't believe that really any serious person here in the United States believes that getting friendly with the Iranian regime will help the so-called mothers. No, they are looking a kind of minimum of deal with the Iranian regime to reduce the tension, just, you know, passing the time, a kind of ceasefire. And is there any way to educate the US politicians to the misinformation of the pro-regime lobbies and point them more towards the anti-regime? Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is, you know, as I mentioned at the end of my talk, 
we have a long way to go. It is very good. I, I see that a lot of Iranian Americans are getting involved and it is enough to talk about among ourselves. You know, we should talk to Americans, to American policymakers, and they are doing so. And this is good. And one part of it is that education. We, we are not, you know, the only thing we can do is education, informing the public and informing the policymakers. Uh, so if we have come a long way and we, are, we still have a long way to go. So what would you suggest that the anti-regime Iranian Americans uh, could do to change that narrative and speak up and get more involved? Uh, excuse me, I didn't understand. Yeah. What would your policy recommendations be? How do you think that the anti-regime Iranian Americans could get more involved? I know they're making great strides right now, but how can we push that a little further? Oh, you know, they, I, I'm pretty sure that they have a lot of um, ideas. My experience, I'm telling two things. First of all, bipartisanship. That is the main thing. That is the main thing. For an Iranian American organization to be effective, we should be bipartisan. Do not get involved with American politics, especially now. This is such a polarized environment. You get involved, you, you are completely ineffective. That I, I'm this is my fear that some small groups coming forward, a smaller one. I'm not talking about MEK or NUFTI. I haven't seen that partisanship from them, but other smaller ones are coming forward. They should avoid partisanship. One thing, and second thing is nothing can be done without organization, organization, organization. You know, this is, look at New York and this is how they have worked. And it is very important. So organization and bipartisanship. Thank you. Uh, who do you think are the best or worst American commentators on Iran? The best and worst commentator? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you know, there are so many good and much more bad. Uh, I don't want to name. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so how do you think the, the pro versus, can you compare pro regime versus anti regime, especially with the um, De, uh, deliberation on rejoining the JCPOA? Oh, uh, you know, um, first of all, we should be worried that the United States is giving too much incentive to the regime. But I still, I think we should not focus so much on that because to, to just giving this image that if it is a new deal, that is the end, Iranian regime will be saved, will get everything. And on the contrary, if there is no, no, this is nothing that. I believe that both United States and Iranian regime are seeking to re-enter a kind of deal. What in the best kind of scenario for Iranian regime, what Iranian will get will be much less than what Obama gave them. The Iranian, Iranian regime situation now in Iran is really bad. So at the end, that cannot change the dynamic in Iran. So if we focus too much on that, like the election, there are this kind of duality that uh, Trump was perfect. If Biden comes, regime is safe. This is not good because we don't see the dynamic in Iran and we don't even see the dynamic of politics here. No. Both cases, of course, this is better and not, you know, not very good. We understand the differences between now and a year ago. Of course, I'm not telling there is no difference, but don't focus too much on it. That is the end of the world and the regime could be safe. No, that regime is in a very, very bad position. Understood, thank you. So another question is, is there any credibility to reports the Ayatollahs are sending agents to the U.S. via the now open southern border. From the southern border, is this threat you mean? Yeah, southern border of the United States, Mexico. Oh, from Mexico? Yes. Oh, well, you know, that's been an issue, security issue for the United States, Iranian regime presence in Latin America because they have, a, not only because of the drug, the, the, the drug trafficking, because it is a real issue, first of all. It is not because the United States hawks are talking about the drug trafficking. 
European, Germany, France, Belgium, Italy, many countries they have been involved and this network of uh, tra uh, drug trafficking, it is real by Hezbollah and Iranian regime quotes forces. This is one issue that is important, but security issue is very important because they have good relations with um, drug cartels and these drug cartels can provide passage to United States and because people here are pretty sure that Hezbollah has dormant cells here. So they are very afraid of the southern borders. And an issue has been for United States, the Iranian regime presence in Latin America. I hope that it has come uh, moments that Iranians also uh, look at this issue that is very important for us too. Thank you. Uh, is there any realistic po possibility that there would be a regime change in Iran in the foreseeable future? Oh, I, I think so. Because not because we hope so, of course we hope, but if we have, you know, we, we can see what has happening economically, politically, what's happening for Iranian regime. Iranian regime is getting weaker, weaker. The, the, the divide between the Iranian people and regime getting wider people, Iran economy is completely collapsing. So if, if you have all these things, we put it together, realistically, we can see if we have had two major uprising in Iran that brought regime to the brink of collapse. This is not, you know, our ideas, our hope for regime change. The regime was really, the regime is really afraid. Regime is weak. And I believe it takes, we don't know, maybe a year, two, three, four years, we don't know. But I can't see anything that could help this regime. It does, I don't see any winning card for the regime to, to be able to use it to save itself. Thank you. Uh, do the Iranian people and government consider Russia an important and friendly country than the, a more important and friendly country than the US? Oh, no, I don't believe so. Even in the, you know, in the regime, because they have no choice, they have turned to Russia. There is an anti-Russian anti sentiment in Iran that is very strong, first of all. And even inside the regime, they know that the Russia has given them nothing. Nothing has profited from them, but they have no choice. They have no choice. In Syria, for example, they couldn't move forward the Iranian regime. Bashar Assad was collapsing. So they turned to Putin to come and help them over there. They have been asking for help. And for one help that Putin has given them, he has taken 10 things from Iran, Iran not from Iranian regime. We are paying for that. Thank you. In our last few minutes here, can you just discuss a little further the Quincy Institute and your work to uh, help on that article? Yeah, the, the Quincy Institute is important for several reasons. <clears throat> First, because, you know, when New York started its lobby, it is true for being successful as a lobby, they wanted to have two different branches. One was to recruit Iranian Americans and the other branch to do lobbying separate. They couldn't do it in the, in the equipment, so they do it together. But another part, because of US system, I lived in France, I lived in Germany before coming here. The system is completely different. The influence of your think tanks, it is huge in United States. It is huge. So they needed really a think tank to support the appeasement from New York's world, pro appeasement lobbies world. So they started Quincy Institute and Tirta Parsi is uh, the executive director. And the other thing that it shows the bipartisanship. You see the first money the seed money that they started with was one of the Cook brothers uh, and George Soros, both from left and right, gave half a million dollars just for this start. And also how the money, how, how the money flows from the foundations in the United States, that is an important issue to them. And secondly, we understand with Queen's Institute, the power and influence of the appeasement lobby. Uh, this is what I told that they are weaker now but we should be careful not to underestimate them. So it gives us a very good picture. And Armin Rosen has been using a lot of internal documents from New York in his report. That is a great, great report, really. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. And can you just tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Some of? Some more of your work. Oh, you know, Iranian American Forum or on the Twitter, Hassan.dai or Iranian Forum. Iranian Forum, Iranian American Forum, they can Google it and they can find it. Thank you, SAC, for inviting me. Of course. Thank you so much again for taking time to speak with us. We've come Thank to the close of our... Much. Thank you. Of course. For our viewers and listeners, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.